Oh no, that's okay. All right. Every day when I go to a shift, there's some new way that kids are breaking their bones. They're riding cardboard down the stairwells, or they're climbing some new something, or there's those hoverboards now. And so kids are these kind of walking time bombs of ways to hurt themselves. But it also
infants who can't be verbal with you, or sometimes it's tough in the teenager who's sitting there texting on their cell phone and you don't believe what they're seeing or what they're saying. But we can do things like the, the faces, and I'm sure you guys probably have this on your rig. So for the little guys, you can have them look at the faces and say, which, which of these look how you're feeling right now? And I try to give kids a context, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of blunt in the ER, but I'll say zero means that you don't have any pain at all. 10 is I'm taking a chainsaw and I'm cutting off your arm. It's the worst pain you can imagine. And then I try to put them in that context where they're feeling. Because a lot of kids will say it's a 10 if they have any pain. So try to give them a context of how bad the worst pain is. And you know, the older kids, the teenagers can just rate one to 10. <coughs> but a lot of times you give them those faces scale and either they can't quite comprehend it or again, you have a kid who's sitting there laughing and giggling and tell them, telling you that their pain is a 10. And we, do diff we need to validate when people tell us what their pain is, because that's their own interpretation of their pain. We also need to remember that a lot of pediatric pain is actually fear and anxiety. Um, and so sometimes what we'll do is we'll use the FACES scale and we'll document that. But we'll also give kids a FLAC score. And the FLAC score, you look at five different kind of things that's going on with their body and score them zero to two. And you have it still have that maximum of 10, so you'll still fall in that zero to 10 scale. But if you have a kid who is just inconsolable and their eyes are clenched and their fists are clenched, um, they're kind of rigid in pain, then obviously they're going to score twos on everything and they're going to get to that 10. So this is a way that sometimes we'll, especially with kids who are, we're not, it's not really computing how they're saying their score is and what we're looking at, we'll document both the flack or the faces. Or for the infants and toddlers who can't communicate with us, we'll give them just the flack score. And these, both the faces and the flack have been validated multiple times in different studies to, to kind of assess pediatric pain and they work pretty well. So circulation deficits, one thing we always worry about with fracture. This can be a true um, orthopedic emergency. So if you don't feel a pulse and the extremity is cool, it's okay. If you have a nice pink warm extremity and you don't feel a pulse, it's still probably okay. But you don't feel a pulse and the extremity is cool, you get worried. Do you, the first thing you want to try to do, we don't expect anyone to try to reduce a fracture or correct a fracture in the field, but you can just try to reposition a limb back into a better anatomical position and see if the, per, the perfusion improves. So if you have a bad elbow fracture and it's hanging like this, if you just try to give it a little bit of a flexion, that might improve your, your uh, perfusion just with that. And if you still are having a cool distal extremity with no pulse, then definitely call ahead and let someone know so the orthopedic team can be waiting. So we'll go through a couple common pediatric fractures and how to manage them. So buckle fracture, this is one of the more common ones. It's also called a torus fracture. It's really common in kids. Usually they fall on an outstretched arm. And it's a compression failure of the bone right between that metaphysis, that wide part in the diaphysis. We usually see it at the distal radius. It's a very stable fracture. You could probably do nothing. It would be fine. It'll heal in three to four weeks with some simple immobilization. You can just use a preformed Velcro splint or a little orthoglass splint. It doesn't cause any long-term problems. So you can see this is an example of a buckle fracture where that bone is buckled out a little bit. It should be nice and smooth. There's actually one on this side too. You can see that little edge right there. But this is a fracture that we see all the time. It shouldn't cause any long-term problem for the kid. I think of it, the torus go, um, is from, I can't remember if it's Latin or Greek or Roman, but the um, columns, you can see it's that same kind of formation there. That's how I remember it. Next fracture we'll talk about is green stick. This is also known as an incomplete fracture. It's where the bone bends and cracks, but it doesn't go all the way across. And sometimes these kids, they show up and they aren't really swollen, they have minimum pain. And again, some people say, oh, you have a sprain of your wrist. But kids don't tend to sprain their wrist. They don't tend to sprain their ankles when they're young. Uh, when you look at the films and you find a green stick, sometimes the orthopedic surgeon has to go in and actually break the bone all the way through, because otherwise it'll keep recoiling back into that abnormal position. So here's an example of a green stick. It's cracked part way through, but it doesn't go all the way through. And this radius is probably bowed a little bit too. So the surgeon would probably go in and crack it across just to realign that and then splint it in that realigned position. Otherwise, you'll get a little bit of a bowed extremity long term. So radial and ulnar fractures kind of in the middle of your arm here. These are, again, one of the real common fractures we see all the time that you guys probably see all the time. Usually from a fall, um, outstretched hands, it can be a fall off in an equipment. Sometimes they require closed reduction if the bones are really angulated or displaced. And the surgeon will make a decision to splint just how it is versus reduce it depending on the age and the angulation. So a little kid, like a one-year-old, 
you can have almost 20 to 30 degrees angulation in those bones and you can leave it and it'll heal just fine because that remodeling potential. But as you reach pupil age, you can't really tolerate very much because you're not going to grow a lot more. And these are best managed after a reduction with a stirrup splint. So here's a both bone fracture. You can see from the front view, it doesn't, it doesn't really look that bad. That's why we always get two views of every pediatric bone. If it was really just like that, you could probably leave it and this kid would be okay. But you see on that lateral view how angulated you got the ulna and radius there. So the surgeon would go in, they actually kind of recreate the break and then straighten it out um, and, and get an, an, an alignment that's acceptable for that age. And this is a kind of splint that's really good for radial and ulnar fractures. So if you ever have a long transport and you have a, what you think is a, a forearm fracture, you could put them in some type of splint like that. And that's a good way to kind of keep that arm stable and comfortable for the patient. Supracondylar fractures, these are the other ones that keep us in business. Anytime we hear that a kid has fallen off of a monkey bar, we just assume they have a supracondylar fracture. We see it all the time. There's swelling deformity at the elbow. The kids will kind of hold their arm like this. It's graded types one through three. And the management, whether you just splint it or whether you cast it and do surgery depends on the grade. This can be really tough to differentiate from lateral condylar fractures or medial condylar fractures or an elbow dislocation without an x-ray. But most of the times in a little kid, if you have an elbow injury that you can see um, it being swollen, it's gonna be a supracondylar. So this is a type one and the fracture line is kind of right through here. The way I describe it to parents is the olecranon comes around and is basically like a hinge. So if you fall and it kind of puts pressure, you're trying to catch yourself and you go forward, that olecranon pops the humerus forward. So this bone kind of comes around, hits here and pops that forward, causing that fracture. That's, a, that's one that would probably be managed just with a splint and would not have to get pins. There's a type two and you can see that one obviously a little bit more displaced. You can see when you get our x-rays, the other things we look for, it's kind of subtle, but there's a blacker area right here and right here. That's a fat pad, and that's signs of increased fluid responding to a fracture. That one would probably go to the operating room and get pins put in. And no one would doubt that that one's going to go to surgery. That's a type 3. And these are the ones you'd worry about circulation, because you think of all the vessels that run right here in your antecubital space. So if this kid was hanging right here and their elbow felt cool, you could try to put that a little bit better into position and you might get some better pulses and perfusion distally. But that kid would go to the OR and get some pins put in their elbow. But these are other examples of elbow injuries. It can be really hard to tell what's what. This is a lateral condylar fracture. So your condyles are those bony prominences here on your elbow. It's subtle, but there's this little chip off right here um, that would need to get pinned back on. And this is an elbow dislocation. And there's probably a little fracture segment sitting right there. And the orthopedic surgeon would sedate that kid, or we would sedate them, and the orthopedic surgeon would pop that elbow back into place. Yeah. <laughs> it's much better with sedation than to do it without sedation. And the best splint for these elbow fractures is a posterior long arm splint. So again, if you're transporting a kid, um, if you had some way just to kind of immobilize it in this type of position, that would be optimal just to keep that elbow stable, and it would make the kid feel probably a lot more comfortable too. Clavicle fractures, these are common in kids and adults. It's about 10% of all pediatric fractures. They're usually sports related in the older kids. It's when they fall directly onto their shoulder, usually with their arm at the side. We see it a ton in the winter with snowboarders. We've already probably had 15 clavicle fractures in the last couple days with the snowboarders. It can also be seen after birth, um, especially with breech deliveries. And sometimes pe people don't know they had a fracture in their clavicle and they see this big bump here. So sometimes families come in and they're worried because there's a bump right here, and it's the callus, the bone forming over an old fracture. 80% of the time it occurs right in the middle of the clavicle. The rest is kind of lateral medial. The kids won't want to lift up their arm at the shoulder, but they should still be able to move their wrist and their fingers okay. They're probably going to say that their shoulder hurts, not their clavicle, but shoulder injuries are really rare in kids. Again, the younger kids, they don't tend to dislocate their shoulders. And so if they're complaining of pain around here, it's probably a clavicle. Most of the time, these are treated just with a sling and a swath and some pain medicines, and it heals within four to six, four to six weeks. And again, it might leave that big bony callus. So there's an example of a mid-clavicle fracture. And this one's not too bad. It's pretty lined up. But even sometimes when we see some that are really angulated or that are overlapping, parents come in and they're referred in because it looks really bad, and we don't do anything. We just put them in a sling and a swath and give them some time. 
It's a non-weight bearing bone. It doesn't have to be lined up perfectly and the body kind of pulls it straight over time. Every now and then if you have a kid where it's tenting enough that it's putting pressure on the skin or there's some future professional athlete, I know all parents think their kids are future professional athletes, but if they're truly like a you know, division four star of the year baseball player, they might go in and pin that back into place. So next fracture we'll talk about is a toddler's fracture. These are really common in kids learning to walk or run. The fancy name is a childhood accidental spiral tibial fracture. So this is a non-displaced spiral fracture in the end of the tibia. Usually what happens is the kid is standing and they go to turn and start walking and they turn on their tibia and they kind of crack through the bottom of their tibia. And you don't usually see any deformity, it doesn't look swollen, but they won't walk. Parents will notice that they're limping or they're just holding their leg up like this or a kid who's trying to walk now is just crawling again. And your initial x-ray can be negative on these guys. These are really subtle fractures. Um, I don't know if you guys can see, there's this little, little line right here where you can imagine if a kid was planted and then turned, that's how they'll kind of split their, their tibia right there. And on this view, I don't know if you can even really see it, that's probably actually a, a vessel or a vessel groove in the bone, not the actual fracture. But sometimes we don't see anything and we just assume it's there, put the kid in a splint and have them come back in a week and take another x-ray and you can see the bone healing. And that's how we know it was there. And then femur fractures, I know you guys transport a lot of these. Most femur fractures are in the mid shaft of the, of the bone. These are the most common pediatric musculoskeletal injury that require hospitalization. In older kids, it's usually from a fall or sports or from a motor vehicle accident. And as you guys know, if you see a femur fracture, you worry about multi-system trauma. You worry about pelvic injury, abdominal injury, because it takes a lot of force to get these. In the toddler age group, it's usually from falling. And then unfortunately, in the younger guys, you worry about child abuse, sometimes with falls as well in the toddlers and infants. So the transverse fractures, the one that goes straight across, these are high energy mechanisms, especially if you're an older kid or adolescent. So again, you think about, could they have hurt, been hurt anywhere else? The spiral fractures, the one that kind of go across, those can happen in just mild falls, especially in walking kids with a rotary force again. So say a kid's running, they slip on the ice and fall, that can cause a spiral femur fracture. And then our kids with weaker bones, kids who have things like osteogenesis imperfecta or underlying bone tumors, neuromuscular conditions like cerebral palsy, our kids with spinal muscular atrophy, kids who don't walk or put weight on their bones have really thin bones and they're high risk of femur fracture even with mild injury. So sometimes parents are just changing a diaper of these kids and they'll fracture their femur, not because of child abuse, but just because they don't have any density to their bones. So this one here on this side is a transverse fracture across. Those are the ones that are the high energy mechanism fractures. Should be concerned about other body trauma. This is an example of a spiral fracture and this kid probably has something like cerebral palsy. Their bones aren't very dense. And so this fracture probably happened without a lot of force to it, unfortunately. And splints work great to immobilize the hip and knee. You put a splint from the iliac crest down to the ankle. People, some people still do traction. I don't know if you guys ever transport in traction around the valley. But if a splint's placed in traction, it needs to be removed as soon as possible because you can get pressure ulcers. And then when they put in that pin on the foot for traction, there's been problems with kids where it's... Uh, cause long-term problems because it gets put into a growth plate in the foot. And so our orthopedic surgeons really have moved away from traction splints. Here in the urban central, it's, it's easy enough, it's quick enough to get you somewhere else without a traction splint. Um, but one of our orthopedic surgeons compared to them to an archaic form of torture. So they would definitely prefer you doing a different type of splint like this or an iliac crest to, to ankle long leg orthoglass splint for transport rather than a traction splint. And that, usually these are the kind of splints or some of those inflatable ones we see you guys bring them in, which are perfect for transport. Femur fractures are usually managed with a spica cast if you're young. So these are these things that look awful to parents. I think they must be really hard to take care of. They leave that little hole for the diaper. And you have to get a specialized car seat. And I don't even know how these kids sleep. I guess they just sleep like little spiders with their legs up. Uh, but they... They don't have to have surgery, they still sedate them to put on these spikas, but it's not an open surgery is my understanding. As they approach kindergarten, then they'll kind of transition to closed reduction with a surgery and sometimes a rod fixation inside of the bone. So we can't have a lecture on pediatric fracture without talking about child abuse. There are certain fractures that are strongly associated with child abuse or non-accidental trauma. 
So always be wary of kids who have fractures when they're not walking. Be suspicious if the fracture doesn't match the developmental stage. So you have a kid who has a femur fracture because they rolled off the bed, but they're only six weeks old. And six week old shouldn't roll. Be concerned when the injury doesn't fit the story to you or be worried if you think you suspect multiple fractures in a child. And we really rely on you guys. You guys are the ones at the scene. You guys are seeing what environment this kid comes from. We really rely on if you have any suspicions speaking up, uh, please tell a physician or a nurse, or if you are called the scene and the parents don't want to transport and you're worried, call um, a law authority, because sometimes that first fracture is the kind of the marker of abuse that is missed at first, and then the kid will come back in with more severe abuse. So if you're in any way suspicious, please speak up. Some of these kind of sentinel fractures, the ones that are very associated with child abuse include femur fractures and a kid who's not walking yet, especially those spiral femur fractures. There's something called a distal femoral metaphyseal corner fracture, and I'll show you guys a picture of that. Posterior rib fractures, scapular spinous fractures. So kids don't break their, their, their scapula. It's really hard to do that. It takes a lot of force. Even kids who are ejected from cars, we don't see scapula injuries. But if you squeeze hard enough or you get thrown against a wall, it can happen. Or proximal humeral fractures. Kids, when they break their humerus, it tends to be in the middle or down near their condyles. It can happen up here, but it, those are sometimes associated with abuse. So this is one of those distal femoral corner fractures. And again, that's usually a parent grabbing the femurs during a diaper change and cranking up um, or twisting. Uh, sometimes we'll see those on other parts of the bone too, like the tibias. And then this is a spiral fracture. You can see these chunky little infant legs. This is a kid who's probably not walking, who has a spiral fracture. And so you're always suspicious of those type of fractures. And if we have a kid come in who has an injury that doesn't fit the story, or there's not a good history, or the history is changing, or we see an injury that is usually a marker of abuse, we do a whole skeletal survey where we look at all the bones of the kids, plus or minus a head CT to look at head injury. These are posterior rib fractures. So the ribs should be nice and smooth. You can see these kind of circular calluses. That's healing rib, and unfortunately with the rib fractures, we don't tend to find them until they've already been healing. So sometimes a kid comes in for respiratory distress, we get a chest x-ray and we see healing rib fractures, and then we have to go back into the family and say, it looks like someone's injured your child, and do a skeletal survey and kind of go, go from there. We don't, send in the acute setting, we don't tend to actually see the rib fractures unless the kid gets a CT scan of their chest for some reason. But if you're working and you see an x-ray and no one's picked up on those, please say something. <laughs> to someone. All right, so let's talk a little bit how to manage fractures. A lot of this you guys already know, and I know it's review, but place a kid in the injured body part in some position of comfort. You can sling or mobilize it in any way you have possible. And then if you do put any type of splint on it, just repeat your neurovascular exam after your splint, just to make sure you haven't compromised any type of perfusion with the splint placement. Your choice of pain medicine is going to depend on the type of fracture, your pain assessment of the kid, the distance of your transport, the route you have available if you have an IV or don't have an IV, and then associated injuries like uh, closed head injury. So if you have a kid who seems pretty comfortable, um, just a little bit achy, you could give ibuprofen or Tylenol. Studies have shown that ibuprofen actually is more effective than narcotics, than oral narcotics are for fracture pain because it has that anti-inflammatory component. So even when I send kids home with a fracture and a splint, I tell parents to give them ibuprofen rather than narcotics because it actually works better. And oral pain medications do not count against a patient's NPO status. So no one's going to get upset if that got, kid got Tylenol or ibuprofen and they have to go to surgery. It's not going to count against them with their NPO. If you have an IV in place, you can give morphine or fentanyl IV. So morphine, I know there's that dose range, but this is how I do morphine. If you're this big, you get half. If you're this big, you get one. And if you're this big, you get two milligrams. Because you can always give more. And some kids are just so sensitive to it, I only give 0.51 or 2. Those are the only doses I ever get. I never calculate out a dose. It's a waste of time. <laughs> so you'll never get in trouble if you give. You know, if you're a really tiny baby, then sure, calculate out a dose. But for the kids who are toddlers or above, I just go by kind of a height range. Because you can always give more. It's a lot harder to give less. And that way you can just kind of judge and see how that kid's going to react to a narcotic. For fentanyl, I stick with a 1 mic per kilo per dose. If you give IV morphine, that's a great option if you have a longer transport or if you have an IV for another reason. Any kid who has fentanyl morphine should be on a continuous pulse ox. I'm sure you guys all do that, but we have had 
instances recently where we've had a kid given morphine for a procedure, um, left alone for a minute without a pulse ox, and was gray with SAT of 23. So we always make sure we keep those kids on a pulse ox. Watch out for respiratory compromise. And then use caution in kids who have a close head injury. We want to treat pain. We don't want our kids to be in pain. But if you're really trying to watch mental status, maybe think about an alternative way to manage pain or giving a smaller dose just so you're not compromising your ability to watch their, their mental status. Intranasal fentanyl is my favorite. I would encourage you guys all to use it. I think it's the easiest. I think it works the best. You double the dose of the IV dose, so you do two mics per kilo, a maximum of 100 mics, pretty much because you can only shoot so much fluid in kids' nose before they freak out. You're going to use an atomizer to give it, and the max is a mil for each nostril. So in an upset kid, you just hold them down and you push it in as fast as you can while trying to extend their head as backwards as you can get it. If you have a nice cooperative child, they'll probably be cooperative until you start shooting it up their nose, but then you tell them to sniff and swallow, and that'll help it go away more quickly and work more effectively. So this is a kid who's probably not thrilled to be getting their fentanyl, but you just kind of hold their head, push that in, can split it between nostrils if it's a small amount, just give it all into one side of the nostril. Fentanyl works really quickly. It reaches the mouth. The nose has that really nice, dense mucosal surface with a lot of good blood flow. And it has a direct connection to the brain via the olfactory route. And it lasts one to two hours. So even if you have an hour transport time, it's going to last. And they've done studies comparing IV versus intranasal fentanyl or intranasal fentanyl versus IV morphine, and there's no difference. Fentanyl works great. So I would encourage you guys all to use more intranasal fentanyl. We, you know, we look at kind of pain management data across the state as part of EMSC, and we still aren't using a ton of IN fentanyl. And so I think it works great if you guys have the atomizers. It's a nice way if, you don't, if you're not sure the kid's going to need an IV. We'll do this when a kid comes in with a fracture we want to get x-rays, and they're in a little bit of pain. We'll just give them this and then allow them um, to kick in before we go take them for, a fra or for an x-ray. The other thing that works really well is distraction. Distraction activities can be a really helpful way to manage pediatric pain and anxiety. So get to know the kids you're, the kids you're transporting, what are they interested in, maybe try singing, show them pictures on your smartphone, talk about their pets or their school, <laughs> anything you can do to kind of connect with the kid and get their mind off of what's going on. So I sing Frozen songs, I talk about minions, think about popular pop culture. You can tell jokes, you can blow balloons, and I see a lot of you guys coming in with, with these things already in place. Sorry, I think I must have talked really quickly, but in conclusion, <laughs> our injuries are a common reason for pediatric treatment and transport. Preteens are much more likely to fracture a bone than hurt a tendon or ligament. Check your neurovascular function distal to the injury and check for associated injuries. You want to splint in a position of comfort. Make sure you assess your patient's pain and then you can document again after treating pain and you have lots of routes for giving pain medications. Choose the one that seems to work best in that situation. I like intranasal fentanyl and don't forget distraction. Questions you guys might have. I actually have one. Sure. <clears throat> Uh, we, we had a question actually in all of in Sacramento. Okay. And so um, the question was with abuse, can I still splint? So I'm assuming within, with abuse cases, is it still okay to splint injuries? Yeah. So it shouldn't, I, that's absolutely okay to splint. It shouldn't can you, change. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So the, the question was if you have a concern for an abuse type injury, is it okay to splint? And the answer is absolutely. Even if you put on a splint, it's not going to change the underlying bony injury and it won't change the ability to assess whether or not that injury is from abuse. So we, our first priority is the comfort and care of our patients. So getting that kid comfortable, then the workup is going to demonstrate whether or not it's abuse, regardless if there's a splint there. So definitely it's okay to splint. from Twitter, actually, okay. and I don't know where they're from, but <clears throat> the question is, and you kind of just touched on this a second ago, what can we do um, to distract, and I think the question was asked when, uh, when you were going through the distraction techniques, yeah. do you just mind reviewing those? Oh, sure, so question about what can you do to distract kids, and I really think, I can't emphasize this enough, 
Distraction is so important for kids because a lot of pain is anxiety and fear. We're really lucky we have child life specialists in our ER who come and play iPads, they blow bubbles, they sing songs, they have those light things that light up, and we're able to do things like sutures and some minor reductions even without pain management because of distraction techniques. So if you can find some way to connect with the kid, um, you know, figure out, some kids are just inconsolable and it's really difficult. And so in those cases, distraction might be just allowing the parent to hold them, if there's a safe way to transport them that way, or trying to blow a balloon animal. Uh, but you can do things, you know, we mentioned popular culture things like movies that are going around. Around Christmas, I talk about what Santa brought. Around Halloween, I ask kids, what are you going to be for Halloween? Um, you can show them, kids are really, kids think ambulances and fire trucks are the coolest thing ever, so show them stuff in your rig, allow them to play with some of the equipment. The other thing kids really like is to understand what's going on, especially if you're in a school age child. Explain to them what you're doing, let them touch the equipment, let them feel the equipment before you put it on them. Give them some options, so if you're going to take a blood pressure, don't say, do you want your blood pressure taken, because they're going to say no, but you can say, okay, we're going to take your blood pressure, do you want it on your arm or your leg? and you give them some empowerment that way. Or, okay, I need to put this on your finger. Do you want it on this hand or this hand? And that way they think they're having a choice and they kind of, some of that fear is taken away from them. Or do it on yourself first. You know, say, this is what it's gonna look like if you put it on yourself. So I think especially in that school age child, they're the ones who are probably the most rational. Infants aren't that rational. Teenagers aren't that rational. But teenagers have less choice. But, you know, in that school age child, if you kind of talk them through it, give them some examples, of things that they think they have a choice with, those are all really helpful. If you have a, uh, I feel like everyone has a smartphone these days, maybe on your smartphone, load up a couple funny little child appropriate videos that are distracting. Um, the iPad seems to probably be the most popular thing to distract kids in the ER. But if you put on a couple short little cartoons or you know, like a little game that you know no parent is gonna object to, maybe a Mickey Mouse Clubhouse game or something that the kids can kind of play with in the rig, that'll be, that'll be really helpful. Just, sorry, do you guys have a question? You're good. Okay. Um, I, and this is just, this is my question to you. Uh, with the catchment area of primary children's, and since we have an audience that's watching from all mm -hmm. over the place, um, what, what tips can you offer for our EMS partners that are, say, like, a, that are coming ground mm -hmm. from, from, um, from uh, like, Twin Falls, or they're coming from... Uh, southeastern Idaho or something like that, mm -hmm. what tips can you offer those guys when they hit their max dose of pain management? Right. Uh, because, th is that making sense? Yeah. What, what, can you, what can you offer, or what can you tell those guys right. um, that are coming ground from three or four hours away? So I would say, first of all, make sure that you're not missing anything else that's causing pain. If it's a verbal child, make sure that that's truly the only area they're having pain is the arm that's fractured or the leg that's mm -hmm. fractured. And then make sure if they're in a splint, it's in a comfortable position, it's not pinching on them, the splint itself is not causing more pain. If they're not in a splint, get them in a splint because the movement is more painful than anything. Uh, if you have a, f a big fracture, like a femur fracture, that's probably the number one thing that'll get transported. There's a lot of muscle spasm associated with that. And so if you've maxed out on narcotics, a lot of times we'll use some Valium. And the Valium, that muscle relaxant, will really help manage pain um, for some of those bigger long bone fractures. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other things that would really be helpful. Again, if you really feel like there's a huge anxiety component, I don't know how, how much you guys are able to mix medications, but maybe Versed instead of more narcotics. Um, again, as long as you're not worried about closed head injury. But I think making sure that you're not missing any type of other fracture or that they are in an a appropriate splint, and we showed some examples of those, those splints for different injuries and then thinking about how much of this is fear or how much is this muscle spasm and maybe augmenting with a different type of medication other than your narcotic. And don't forget ibuprofen. If you've given narcotics, you can always give ibuprofen. That's gonna be effective and it's gonna take away some of that inflammatory component of the fracture. Thank you. So uh, two questions. One, you said uh, no more traction splints. Um, we typically carry a Sager splint at what age do you use those, if at all? Uh, is that musculature uh, on a femur fracture uh, an issue with uh, going into spasm and causing right. more damage? 
So the question is whether about traction splints and what age would we start to use them versus be concerned about muscle spasm at what age and, and how much that worse it's going to make the fracture. So if you're not pubertal yet, I would say just do a, a long leg splint. There's not as much, in adults they definitely get more muscle spasm, it shortens the limb. You worry more about vascular injury or vascular compromise in adults. We don't tend to see those problems in kids, especially the younger kids. So if a kid has not yet, re not re yet reached puberty, I would stick with a long leg splint or one of those inflatable splints that you guys have, and that's gonna be more than adequate. If you truly have a limb that's shortened and you think there's maybe some vascular compromise, you can think about the traction splints. You guys have the ones that don't have the pin, right? That go in them, so the ones without the pin are fine. I still think for a fairly short transport time, an hour or less, I'd rather have an inflatable or a, a long leg. You know, if you have a really long transport time and you are worried about a lot of muscle spasm in a kid who's reaching puberty or beyond, then maybe one of those, those traction splints. But it's just really painful for the little guys and uncomfortable, and most of the time they don't get the problems that the older kids do with really bad muscle spasm or with any type of vascular compromise. One other question on uh, the administration of IN fentanyl. Um, how clear does it know it has to be? Yeah, those little guys have a lot of boogers. It, you know, we give it all the time to kids, and I've never had a problem unless they're truly, you know, the young kid with bronchiolitis who's pouring out snot. Most of the time it goes in, the, the mucosa is so good at absorbing things that as long as you can get it in, it's going to be okay. So. Unless, unless you truly feel like the kid is just pouring out snot, I would think that intranasal fentanyl is going to be adequate. We give it for sedation and anxiety and all kinds of stuff in all age ranges of kids, and I've never had a problem where it doesn't seem to be absorbed. There are um, kids who try to spit it out, you know, they try to blow it back out, but it's absorbed pretty quickly, and so most of the time that's not an issue either. Okay. Um, one of our online viewers from Castledale asked um, about your opinion on Versed for kids with severe fractures for muscle relaxation and anxiety. What's your thoughts? So I think, you know, if you have a real bad, especially femurs are the ones that I think more than anything cause muscle spasm. I think that if you, I usually don't give it right away, but if I've given, uh, sorry if I didn't repeat the question, it's about giving Versed for muscle spasm and, and fractures. So. If I've given a fairly good amount of narcotic and I think I've reached my maximum of narcotic, then I'll consider it. And we do usually use Valium, but I know you're limited to what, you know, whatever medicines you have on your rig. And so I don't think there's a problem giving Versed. As long as you're using the right dose of the intranasal Versed, we use between 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. And we max at 10 milligrams on our intranasal Versed. And again, as long as you have a kid who's hooked up to a pulse ox, um, especially if you're missing narcotics with Versed. But if you have a kid you still feel like is just scoring really high on that pain scale and you're concerned about giving more narcotics or you're unable to give more narcotics, I think adding a second adjunct, whether it be ibuprofen, which does have some muscle relaxant properties, or Versed or Valium is, is um, a good idea, especially if you have a long transport. Another online viewer asked about the dose of ibuprofen. Yeah, so the dose of ibuprofen is 10 milligrams per kilogram, and you max, them, uh, you max that out at 800 milligrams just with adults. And you can, be, you can round up to something that's easy for you to pull up. I mean, ibuprofen, unlike Tylenol, you don't worry as much about, you, you can overdose, but you don't have very much concern with overdose with a couple of doses. And so if your kid measures out to 400 and not, or say 550 milligrams, give them 600 milligrams, give them three tablets. It's okay to give a little more rather than trying to, you know, find the exact milliliter to measure to. But 10 milligrams per kilogram is the ibuprofen dose. I think everyone does a really good job. I don't have any concerns about the way fractures are handled that get brought back into to our facility. I think people do a really good job with kids and fractures. And I think that the most helpful thing for us when you're calling report is just to let us know the big things would be any concern of circulation, any concern of an open fracture and how open it is, and then just making sure we know what pain medicines were given before they arrive so we don't give too much of the same thing. I think those are the things that are really important. And then also just 
making sure there's no sign of multi-system trauma is, um, is great. And I know you guys all do that. You all do a really good job at primary and secondary survey. And then, of course, always keeping just that doubt in the back of your mind and just your concern for young kids and, and child abuse. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there, with non-accidental trauma and child abuse, I mean, if we have the time, we can call uh, DCFS mm -hmm. and give them the heads up. And if there's, if the nurse isn't too busy and if social work is there, we can sometimes give a really good report of yeah. conditions and just kind of what was, you know, off in our assessment. Other than that, if, if we're not able to do either of those two options, is there anything else as being the child's advocate that you would suggest yeah. doing? So the question was about if you have a concern for child abuse, a lot of times our EMS crews will have talked to DCFS or as they come in we'll give report to the nurse or social worker if they're present just to make sure that information is conveyed. I would, I would definitely say if you are called and you are not able to speak to anyone directly about making sure someone's calling DCFS for your own legal protection, you guys are all obliga obligatory uh, reporters. So for your own protection, make sure that someone is calling DCFS if you haven't done it because we don't want that to slip through the cracks, especially if you're called to a home and you're a little bit concerned and the parents are refusing transport and you can't say that there's an immediate life-threatening need where you have to transport that kid, um, call DCFS yourself. And once you're at the hospital, I think if you, you know, sometimes report in the room is so chaotic, depending on how many people are in there or if the parent's in there with a the child, pull out the nurse, pull out the doc. There's none of us who will ever mind you saying, hey, can I just talk to you for one sec? and just let us know what you saw at the scene, or that the story, you're, you know, you're listening to what the parent's saying in the room and it's not matching what you guys heard the parent tell you, just pull someone out and say, hey, that story has changed, and make sure that your story is documented somewhere and that that change has been documented. And then again, in terms of being a, an advocate, I think the biggest thing would be if you come across a home where, even if you're not worried about abuse, but you have concerns of, you know, uh, a kid being neglected in any way, even if it's not purposeful, but you can tell a kid doesn't have enough to eat, or the home is just a complete ran shackle, call DCFS and just, or um, two on one and ask for some resources for the family just to, to be an advocate for that kid because they can't speak for themselves, obviously. Any other questions? Thanks, you guys. Sorry that was a little short. I talk really fast. <laughs> I always try to talk slowly and I forget. Thank you. All right, gents, you signed the roll. That is it. Have a good one. There's some more if you want. Say thanks to Zach. Say thanks to Dr. Hughes. Thank you, Dr. Hughes.